<laughs> it is really i didn't know that <laughs> what's your utmost you know i have a <laughs> an utmost impossibility that i would love to see happen i'm almost loath to share it as the old expression goes but you know i'd love to see someday that my wife would you know sit here with me and you know maybe read the devotional and you know and then she wants to you know walk away or something no i'm kidding if she wants to sit here and listen to me god knows she listens enough to me she doesn't want to listen to me but you know it'd be fun if i if she could read the devotional and you know maybe once in a blue moon and you know, if she was confident enough to share something, I'd be thrilled to death. But most of the time, she's very reluctant to speak and nervous about that. Though she tells wonderful stories about everything else except for, you know, God and the Word of God. But that's okay, too. Because if you know me, I can make up for ten people. <laughs> But it is kind of my utmost idea that I'd love to see happen. Just so that once in a while there's, you know, a record of her and I sharing Jesus together, the three of us, an devotional with you, you know, and you could see how much joy there is and <laughs> well. I can share with you how much love I have for my wife that there was such a long journey to find this woman that God gave me, you know, to be so blessed and content to have my soul put at ease where it was always at unrest for all the things that I had gone through, whether divorce or being abandoned or all the things that you know religious or emotional turmoil can happen to people when Satan comes in to rob and destroy and to ruin lives and you find that what he tries to ruin God can make complete because in the fallibilities or the weaknesses you would say of my wife is the strengths of my character so together we make a completion and i like that you know i i love the idea that god has made me complete with her <laughs> even if she drives me nuts and i drive her crazy oh what a blessing uh, and in utmost receiving oneself in the fires of sorrow what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. My attitude as a saint to sorrow and difficulty is not to ask that it may be prevented from me, but to ask that I may preserve the self that God created me to be through every fire of sorrow. Our Lord received himself in the fire of sorrows. His character was developed there. He was saved from the hour, but not out of the hour. We say that there ought to be no sorrow, but there is sorrow. And we have to receive ourselves, meaning who we are, through its fires that burn within our soul. If we try and evade sorrow, or hide from it or run away, and refuse to lay our account with it of who we are, we are foolish. Sorrow is one of the biggest facts in life. It is no use saying sorrow ought not to be. Sin and sorrow and suffering exist. They are. It is not for us to say that God has made a mistake in allowing them to be, or that it's the curse and it shouldn't be. Sorrow burns up a great amount of shallowness, but it does not always make a man better. Suffering either gives me myself or it destroys me myself you cannot receive yourself in success you lose your head and you cannot receive yourself in monotony you become a grouse or you become mundane or lukewarm the way to find yourself 
the self that is Jesus in you is in the fires of sorrow. It shows and reveals who you truly are. You always know the man who has been through the fires of sorrow and received himself, the man that God is creating him to be, and you recognize him because you are certain you can go to him in trouble and find that he has always time to listen to you. If a man has not been through the fires of sorrow, he is more than likely to be contemptuous or to be impatient or to not listen to you or care. He has no time for you. He is busy about the business of being in the business of ministry. If you receive yourself in the fires of sorrow, God will make you nourishment for other people and you will be his counselor to someone else who is going through the same sorrow, the same fire. You know, I... I know a man by his scars. I don't know him by his words. Because in every person I've ever met that seemed to be such a great expositor or a great teacher, I wasn't impressed. But the person who took the time, the sensitivity, the ability to touch another soul in suffering, caught my full attention. I understand what it's like to not have someone visit you in suffering. I know what it's like to have a church that says they love you and never show up when you were in hospital. I know what it's like to have people say, oh, where were you if we would have only known when I know that I told them so. I know what it's like to be lied to and to be hurt. I know what it's like to be rejected in the midst of a congregation and then they find out the truth and they still don't know how to admit they were wrong. But in all these things, those didn't make me bitter, although they could have. They didn't make me hate the people that I was around, although they should have. It didn't even make me want to leave or to not be a part of where those people places and those times occurred. In fact, it drove me to the place of recognizing in others the same ability and capability to crucify Jesus on the one hand when just a few hours earlier they loved him as their Lord. So when you go through any of those fires, the scars that are produced in you aren't meant to tear you and make you into someone becoming bitter against but rather positive for someone else who may be needing to hear the love of God and the mercy and grace that only Jesus himself who was despised and rejected of men as the Son of Man would understand and know what you're going through. Because he, more than any other man, was rejected by every man and mistakenly identified as just a man. And the reality was, it was the very God who created man. When you suffer, as Utmost says, I can't tell you how to survive not being bitter. Because people will do that at times. But I can tell you that if you ask God to help you, if you take it to the Lord in prayer and leave it there, if you ask him to change your mind and change your heart and change the way that you're reacting to it, he will. But you got to do it because if you leave it inside you, it will destroy all that God is making in you to be peaceful, loving, joyful, merciful, kind, tender, long-suffering, the ability to share Jesus and the ability to be Jesus to someone else who needs it because they are hurting and desperately wanting someone like you, like me, who's gone through it and now can touch another life with him. And what are we touching them with? The finger of God, the love of God the heart of our Messiah, of Jesus, 
<laughs> we'd say in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. Who cares? But the very compassion that God looks down and has upon us when we don't know that we've lost our way. Don't let it be bitter. Let it be better. And let it become a bridge to someone else who needs to know the love that you received.